my name is Cheryl Pemberton. I'm with the Mid-Continent Public Library for uh, those of you who are, are just, just now joining us. Um, and we wanna thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we do value your feedback about our programs. I will be putting a link to a survey in the chat a couple of times at the beginning of the program, at the end of the program, and we really do value your feedback. We also have a couple programs coming up that you might be interested in. On June 1st, we have From Slaves to Soldiers at 7 p.m., and I will put a link to that registration in the chat. And then next month's uh, program that is uh, sponsored by the Missouri State Parks is Black Baseball and Black History on June 17th at 7 p.m. And I'll also put that registration in the chat. Um, this program is being recorded. And uh, again, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Cecilia Bregerman from the Missouri State Parks. Thank you, Cheryl. Hello and good evening, everyone. I am very excited to introduce to you tonight my colleague, Kevin Smith. Kevin has worked for the Department of Natural Resources for more than 12 years and has been in state parks for the past five of those years, where he serves a variety of roles, including being an interpreter. A Washington DC native, Kevin has lived in several countries where he has experienced many cultures and along the way has developed a passion for history. Outside of work, he enjoys spending time traveling with his family, reading and researching historical events. Thank you all for being here and Kevin, please take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you, Cecilia. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Hello, my name is Kevin Smith. I'm an interpreter from Missouri State Parks. And today I'm going to talk to you about the 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps, also known as the Iron Riders. Most individuals have not heard of these extraordinary people or their historic ride, historical ride across the country or mid-America during the summer of 1897. The 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps was formed from members of the all black regiment stationed in Fort Missoula, Montana. This, side this slide shows the individuals. But who were the Buffalo Soldiers? Buffalo Soldiers is a term that was used to refer to anyone African American of African American heritage that served in the Western frontier following the Civil War. The Army Organization Act of 1866 created six all black cavalry and infantry regiments that were later combined into four, the 9th and 10th horse cavalry and the 24th and 25th infantry. Known as the Buffalo Soldiers, either due to their hair, their curly hair, the Buffalo Soldiers coats or the Buffalo hide coats, which were typically worn during the winter time, as you see in the slide there, or because of their fierce fighting that the Native Americans exhibited and saw from these individuals knowing that you know they were in a bad situation. This painting here called The Premonition by artist Bob Van I think exemplifies it because it's a Native American holding what appears to be a buffalo skull and he, he appears to be explaining the significance of the buffalo to the buffalo soldier because the buffalo is the main source of food, income, clothing, and their overall wall well-being while on the, on the Native Plains. So what we do know about the uh, Buffalo Soldiers is the African-American soldiers knew the term was a term of respect and a revered animal by the Native Americans. And the 10th Cavalry also featured the image of the Buffalo on their emblem. In this slide, you'll see General George Custer. With the end of the Civil War in 1865, effectively freeing slaves, many held firm belief of superiority over the newly freed Blacks. For example, only white troops could be commissioned as officers in the army. Many officers refused to lead Black troops. And in some cases, they accepted lower rank or to be assigned to all white units. In the case of General Custer, he not only refused to lead Black troops, but he also lobbied President Andrew Jackson for command of an all white regiment, which was granted and he opposed the 14th Amendment, which gave newly freed slaves citizenship. A very interesting character in American history, no doubt. This photo here shows the Buffalo Soldiers in formation circa 1895. 
The black units were typically given outdated weapons, aged horses, poor clothing, lower quality food, housing, and pay than their white counterparts. And they were typically stationed in remote areas and outposts where contact with whites was relatively limited. Um, they were not allowed to go into the towns that they protected from Indian raids. And they it faced extreme racism from not only those that they protected, but also from their superiors. There were also instances where the black troops encountered white units in the field, which resulted in conflicts between groups wearing identical uniforms. The only difference was their skin tone. Given all these adversities, the Buffalo soldiers had lower desertion rates and higher reenlistment rates than their counterparts, and they still persevered. The Army provided an opportunity for Black troops to gain employment, pay, and basic education, which was not the case pre-Civil War. In this photo here, the, the Black and White photo, these are brand new troops that are for the, for, from the 25th Infantry. They were new recruits from Philadelphia in 1864, and they were posing for a photo that would later become a recruiting flyer called Come and Join Us Brothers, which was put out by the Super Supervisory Committee for Recruiting Colored Regiments in 1864. And when I found this photo, I was pretty much surprised because they just added a little drummer boy, a flag in the back, and a teepee. But it's the exact same photo. So the commander, the commanding officer of the 25th Infantry in 1897 was Lieutenant James Moss. James Moss. He was a recent graduate of West Point. He graduated dead last in his class and was considered to be the class GOAT, which is interesting as the term GOAT in modern terms is an acronym for the greatest of all times. Go figure. Um, at the time of Moss's graduation, assignments were based on class rank. And this is how Lieutenant Moss ended up with the 25th Infantry in Missoula, Montana. Lieutenant Moss, being an avid bicycle fan, had the idea of testing bicycles for use in Army troop movements. There were several countries that incorporated bicycles for military movements prior to the 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps. Italy, France, Germany, Canada, Switzerland, England, all had very success with the new, the new fad technology called the bicycle. There are several disadvantages to using horses as opposed to bicycles for military use. Horses require food, water, rest, shelter. They can be injured or killed, and a lot of times they're relatively noisy, which is not the case for a bicycle. Go figure. None of these apply to bicycles, which is a great thing. The Army approved the formation of the Bicycle Corps, but did not allocate funds for equipment. Lieutenant Moss ended up contacting the Spalding Company, who agreed to lend the bicycles to the Army in exchange for the Bicycle Corps in promotion for materials for the company. And this is an image of one of the promotions that was put out by the Bicycle or by the Spalding Company. And as you can see, it's got Lieutenant James Moss in there and a couple of drawings of individuals on bicycles. And this is a Spalding advertisement from February 9th, 1897. The bicycles provided were 1897 Spalding military specials. They weighed roughly 32 pounds, had a metal seat, and were fully equipped with bed wraps, spare parts, supply container that was in the middle of the frame, as you can see in the photo there. And the, with all of that equipment, the bicycle weighed close to 60 pounds when it was all said and done. There is also a, an advertisement of a Spalding um, bicycle there, an image of the seat, as well as the seat or bicycle specifications of what the bicycles were being advertised as back in the days. And the seat does not look comfortable at all for a long ride. When Lieutenant Moss presented his plan to the soldiers under his command and asked for volunteers, bicycles were still relatively a new fad in the 1890s. One soldier, Private John Finley, having previously worked for the Imperial Bicycle Works in Chicago, Illinois, not only knew how to ride a bicycle, he could also repair one. Finley's experience made him critical to the Bicycle Corps' training and success, teaching other riders maneuvers and basic maintenance of their bicycles. 
The original Bicycle Corps was comprised of eight enlisted men. The select group spent the summer of 1896 training with bicycles. For some, first learning how to ride bicycles, then learning how to ride for miles at a time. Learning to ride with no hands while shooting, as well as crossing streams carrying the bicycles on their backs. After several weeks of training, Moss felt that these individuals were ready for an overnight ride. This slide shows the riders that volunteered to be part of the experiment, and the asterisk indicates the individuals that actually rode on the 1900 mile ride with Lieutenant Moss. The first overnight trip was, well, there was two overnight trips actually, but this is the first one. The first overnight trip was made to Lake McDonald, Montana in August 8th of 1896. It was a 126 mile round trip trek uh, included four days of travel, three nights of camping. The group carried 120 pounds of provisions split between the riders. Each rider had clothing, personal care items, spare bicycle parts, tools, etc. The soldiers rode with camping supplies consisting of bedrolls and tents that were attached to the handlebars. And an army stipulation was that they had to carry their rifles over their shoulders and each man had to carry 50 rounds of ammunition to make it somewhat authentic and effective in you know, military, military times. Um, on this trip, the group encountered lots of rain the first day and had several stops to remove cake mud from the tires. They, the roads were rocky. A lot of times they had to walk the bicycles. Um, they encountered swarms of mosquitoes. They had several broken pedals, damaged chains, flat tires, and even tires that had to be reglued because they became separated from the wooden rims. So they really had some tough times they, when the rims became separated and that was all due to water exposure. Despite all of this, Moss noted in his journal that everything was fine, the beautiful scenery, excellent fishing made up for the difficult journey. Regardless of what it was gonna be, Moss decided it was gonna be a success. When the group arrived back at Fort Missoula, Montana, Lieutenant Moss considered it a great success and quickly began planning the second longer test ride, which took place a few days later. The second overnight trip was to Yellowstone National Park. The Bicycle Corps de departed Missoula, Montana, August 15th, 1896. There were eight riders. They went on a three and a half week ride. Um, 120 pounds of provisions were split between the riders and additional supplies were sent ahead via rail or by train um, to predetermined destinations where they could pick them up. In addition, uh, medical supplies were added and a camera was added with several rolls of film, which these photos here Moss himself actually took and of the riders to document the trip. Lieutenant Moss noted that many people were friendly, cheering and trading with the troops while on this ride. On this trip, they also ran out of food between supply stops. One rider named William Brown, who I believe was the, was the uh, musician brought along for entertainment, um, ate wild fruit and became ill and had to be transported by train um, to Yellowstone. And he later completed the ride with the group. Um, they averaged 45 miles per day on uneven terrain and they reached Yellowstone in eight and a half days on a bicycle. And you remember what the seat looked like so you can imagine how they felt. As they made their way through many rural communities, people were surprised to see black soldiers in uniform riding bicycles outfitted with, cam with camping gear, which would have been highly unusual during those times and still somewhat unusual today. Um, they spent a few days seeing the sites of Yellowstone, visiting Mammoth Springs, which is a photo here. And they also visit Old Faithful, which is the darker photo down towards the bottom. And that's an image of the gentleman riding riding past Old Faithful as it's blowing. Pretty cool. Upon their return to Missoula, Moss again was pleased with the results and began planning the 1900 mile trip over varied terrain going to St. Louis, Missouri. This slide here is additional photos of the men when they were on their way to Yellowstone and some of some of their photos. The route that Lieutenant Moss chose for the St. Louis ride was to follow the Northern Pacific Rail Line to Billings, Montana. Then along the Northern, the Burlington Northern Line from Wyoming to Nebraska, and then he was going to parallel the Missouri River into St. Louis. For the St. Louis expedition, 
40 men initially volunteered for this historic journey. Lieutenant Moss hand-selected 20 riders ages 25 to 39, and the Army required that no riders could weigh over 140 pounds and no one could be over 5 feet 8 inches tall. I'm not really sure why that stipulation was, but it could have been just so the riders looked somewhat uniform in their in their size, body, and build. I'm not really sure, but that's just a, a guess or a speculation. Um, Lieutenant Moss had to obtain special permission for anyone that he hand selected that was outside of those um, army parameters because that's just what it was. And he did obtain the permission for one individual. I, I believe it was Big Frank, uh, Frank Johnson, that he obtained permission for. Um, in preparation for the trip, Lieutenant Moss requested several modifications be made to the bicycles, including wooden rims were upgraded to steel making the bike upgraded to steel rims, making the bicycle considerably heavier than before. A more comfortable seat was added and a rubber chain cover was put over the chain to protect the train, the chain from mud, debris, and all of those types of things that made the bicycle basically inoperable. Um, for this trip, supply trips were set up or supply stops were set up 50 to 120 miles apart, depending on the terrain and how much um, of the course that uh, they could complete in that day. And each man carried the same amount of supplies, meaning extra parts, tools, personal care items, et cetera, along with their rifles and their 50 pounds or 50 rounds of ammo. The final list of riders. Um, this is pretty interesting because it consisted of Dr. James Kennedy, who was also a lieutenant, but they decided to take a surgeon along for um, medical support. And Lieutenant James Moss, who of course was in charge of the whole group. And then they had a young reporter um, named Edward Bowes, who was um, a reporter for the Daily Missoulian. And I believe that um, Edward Bowes is the reason why this trip is so well documented is because they had a reporter that was embedded with them. And as long as he's with them and he's giving day-to-day -day reports and sending them back um, to his home paper, the Daily Missoulian, that's how the story got out and was so well documented throughout the, the newspapers all over the country. Um, you had the acting first sergeant who was Mingo Sanders, and he serves pretty much as a liaison between the officers and the enlisted troops. And then you have the list of all of the, all of the troops. And you also had a musician for entertainment. On the first day of the ride, the Daily Missoula ran this article. Lieutenant Moss ordered his troops to double ride in formation when they came into the towns, which became the standard approach. In the article, it says, the start was made from the post this morning at 540, when a salute was fired upon their departure. They arrived in Missoula at 6.05 and were cheered by many along the streets as they passed through the town. They presented a pleasing picture and their progress watched with interest from one end of the nation to the other. Edward Bose, the, the uh, reporter that was embedded with the group. The first day out, the group encountered heavy rains, riding in weeds to avoid the mud. Even in these conditions, they still managed to cover 50 miles. In the photo above there, you can see all 22 riders with Lieutenant Moss out in the front. And the photo below is what they may have encountered on those on their trip. Um, the worst in the worst conditions, the group rode along the rail lines, preferring the jolts of the rail ties to the muddy conditions. As they crossed the continental divide, they experienced melting snow at lower elevations, requiring the soldiers to cross ankle deep freezing water. At a tavern in Big Timber, after they had crossed the Continental Divide, a Civil War veteran bought drinks for the entire company as a show of appreciation for fellow members of service, regardless of their skin tone. And they were actually allowed to drink these drinks in the tavern, which is a cool thing. Um, the Corps attracted, uh, Lieutenant Moss wrote, the Corps attracted a great deal of attention as we rode through the rural mountain districts. Horses and cows ran from us, and the inhabitants would stop their work and gaze in astonishment. Again, it was highly uncommon to see African-Americans riding bicycles with firearms right after the Civil War. So it, it would cause quite a spectacle. On June 25th, 1897, the Corps reached the Little Bighorn Battlefield. 
Lieutenant Moss later commented in the Los Angeles Times, as the evening shadows began to fall, there appeared amid the hills in the distance, a number of small white tombstones, the silent resting place of Custer's glorious band. Camp was pitched on the banks of the Little Bighorn within a stone's cast of a large wooden cross on which is inscribed, here fell Custer. Indeed, the surroundings of our little camp that night were replete with memories most sacred. The whole corps walked over to the Custer Monument, a large piece of pyramid-shaped granite bearing the names of every member of Custer's command. And if you look in the photo, that uh, tombstone, the little one with the dark um, inscription there, that is actually where they say Custer was found, right there. Coincidentally, the 25th Infantry arrived on the battlefield on the 21st anniversary of Custer's last day. The 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps departed the Custer battlefield the next morning and crossed the Little Horn River as many as seven times, twice wading across in low areas. The group pressed on to Parkman, Wyoming, facing a fast approaching, fast approaching storm and eager to get out of the Crow Indian Reservation, which Custer Battlefield is part of, and the Crows were the, the Crow Indian tribe was the main tribe or the, 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 the largest tribe that participated in that day. Um, so yeah, then, then they crossed over into Billings, Mont or since they had been in the Crow Reservation since they left Billings, Montana. So they were eager to get out of that area. The men arrived in Sheridan, Wyoming. They received their rations from a train depot and they set up their camp. The officers and journalists ate in the Sheridan Inn while the black riders ate baked beans and bread outside. The Sheridan Inn was built by William Buffalo Bill Cody in 1892. And it's not known if he was present when the Corps passed through that area, but it was definitely his and they definitely ate inside while the the main bulk of the troops ate outside. The next few days were spent in rain-soaked clothes on impassable roads. The group on several occasions was strung over several, mi several miles, stopping to wait before they entered town for the stragglers to come in and then they rode in customary double formation into town to have the appearance of a functioning military unit, which was a big deal um, for the military to appear as professional in front of civilians. At this point, the group had traveled through Wyoming, South Dakota, and were entering Nebraska without improvements in the weather or the roads. On July 3rd, the group made it to Crawford, Nebraska, and was met with cheers and music as they rode in customary double formation. Soldiers from nearby Fort Robinson made the court met with the Corps and assisted the Bicycle Corps with repairs. As they made their way through the plains of Nebraska, temperatures were over 100 degrees, making the handlebars too hot to hold. Several riders, including Lieutenant Moss, became ill drinking water that was contaminated with high levels of alkali, and they had to either stay where they were or ride ahead to meet up with the group later. Um, when they reached Lyons, Nebraska, the Corps celebrated having ridden 1,000 miles, and it was a huge celebration and they had a great time with the townsfolks. On July 16th, the expedition reached Missouri, reached the Missouri River, and they crossed the river at Rollo, Nebraska, and they crossed by ferry. Here's an image of the individuals crossing the ferry, and then you can see a picture of the actual bridge itself. With Edward Bowe sending regular reports to the Daily Missoulian, by the time they reached Missouri, the story was well known across the country and across the nation. Here we have an article from July 17th, 1897, published in the Salina Daily Republican Journal in Salina, Kansas, mentioning the 25th Infantry camping near Napier, Missouri. And at this point, they were only, what, 353 miles by rail from St. Louis. So they were making good time. When the group reached St. Joseph, Private John Finley, a Missouri native, 
was permitted to remain in his hometown to visit his family for an additional period of time. I think the time uh, period was uh, two days. Uh, Finley being the most experienced with a bicycle, he had no problems catching up with the group uh, before their next supply stop. Upon leaving St. Joseph, the group arrived in Cameron, Missouri. And here's an, expert, an excerpt from the Cameron Daily Observer. A novel sight was witnessed in Cameron Sunday. Soldiers fully armed and equipped for war riding bicycles. Their arrival here about noon created quite a commotion. They made the park their headquarters and scores went to see them. The soldiers were colored, which is very important because this is the first time they were identified by race and this is in Missouri. The soldiers were colored and in charge of Lieutenant Moss. Moss Lieutenant Moss was in charge of them and then they identified Moss as a white man who went through here on cars Sunday evening. On cars mean he rode the train through that area. He was probably still recovering from the alkali water in Nebraska. And he was accompanied by the reporter on the cars. So the only person that was actually riding with the soldiers when they reached Cameron was the surgeon. And then they made a, a, they made a point to point out that the only white man in the crowd was the surgeon. Now, this is very important because throughout the entire ride, never were the riders um, identified by color until they hit Missouri. Now, in this image here, you have an image of the area in Missouri called or termed or called Little Dixie. Little Dixie is the area where the bulk of the slaves were during the slave time. Um, it's because of their fertile ground and they used to grow a lot of crops and, and all of that all of that type of stuff that was going on during those days. Um, so they essentially rode from one end of Little Dixie, also known as the Missouri Black Belt, to the other end. And in this whole entire area is where they started to encounter worse and worse racism. It was like the further east they got, things got worse. And yeah, things just got out of control. Um, the article also mentions Lieutenant Moss and Bose having rode through on a car. Um, the 25th Infantry camped in Laclede, Macon, and Louisiana, Missouri, which were all areas in the Little Dixie region of Missouri. Um, little, Lieutenant Moss later recalled the Missouri portion of the trip as, quote unquote, when away from the railroad, people were inhospitable. In one instance, water for cooking was refused and no reliable information regarding roads was gained, end quote. And that's from Lieutenant Moss. Upon reaching St. Charles, they were met by local wheelmen from St. Louis and a mounted police escort down Union Avenue to Forest Park. The expedition ended at the cottage restaurant in Forest Park, St. Louis, where Lieutenant Moss gave his final order. Thank you for your fortitude. You will now rest and fall, rest your wheels and fall in for mess. This is a sketch from the article with the St. Louis Globe Democrat from July 25th, 1897, and the image of the cottage restaurant where they ate. Now, this is also interesting because not only did the soldier or the, the, uh, officers and the reporter actually go into the restaurant and eat, but the riders themselves had a table set up in a shed and they had food in the shed next to their bicycles. And then there was one article mentioned that a bunch of watermelons were brought down to the group and, you know, they're pretty much a spectacle for anyone that was watching African-Americans eat watermelon, which is pretty typical Southern. Um, Lieutenant Moss considered the test success and requested to further test the bicycle on a ride to, or to St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, the request was denied and the soldiers were ordered to return to Missoula by train and which they arrived in mid-August. The riders rode 1900 miles, traversing snowstorms, wading across streams. They rode across railroad tracks, bad roads, rain, mud, illness, um, 100 degree temperatures, half a dozen broken bicycle frames and 17 separated tires. So they had their share of issues on these 1900 miles. As, a tip, as typical with military service, the soldiers were eventually transferred to various locations in the United States and overseas to continue their active duty enlistment assignments. And the soldiers in this little known expedition will 
forever be remembered for their contributions and sacrifice to their country and desire to be recognized as equals. I would also like to mention um, that the St. Louis uh, Globe newspaper called this the most marvelous cycling trip in the history of the wheel. Now, the Greater Los Angeles chapter of the 9th and 10th Horse Cavalry Association will be hosting, or the Greater Los Angeles chapter, 9th and 10th Horse Cavalry Association, the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum, Destination Missoula, and others will be hosting a week-long event in Missoula, Montana to commemorate the 125th anniversary of this historic ride. There will be presentations, demonstrations, tours of the area, and lots of activities for um, folks that may want to be interested in it. Um, there I have Trooper Bobby McDonald's contact information, who is the president of the Greater Los Angeles chapter. And if you can't get that information, feel free to contact me and I can definitely forward that information to you. Are there any questions? We Any questions? Um, well, yes, I have a question. Yes, ma'am, go right ahead. So I've always heard of the Buffalo Soldiers, um, but not in relationship to bicycles. Um, I thought they were well known for bravery and, and, and their uh, horsemanship and things like that. Was was this just part of that group? Um, yes, ma'am. This was part of the group. Everything that you said um, is fairly accurate. Yes, um, but this was one of the untold stories that not many people are necessarily familiar with. Um, I see a hand raised. Is there a way? Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Kevin Smith, Bobby McDonald. Yeah. How you doing, Mr. McDonald? I'm doing fine, sir. Great presentation. Awesome. Awesome. I even learned something today. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question to you um, is, is, you know, you, you, Bowles was the reporter. How did he get his information back? Did he have carrier pigeons that they, they figured out they went to a town that had uh, telegraph? How did you get the information back to, to make these, these stories? As Bose was entering the various towns, he would send wire communication back. Okay, very good. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got one. Go right ahead, sir. Yes, yeah, so I've got a question. Can you hear me okay? Hey, you just fine. Yes, sir. Okay. It was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, after this trip was completed and everything was written down, did they, did they keep the bicycling in the military uh, for any other uh, activities after this, or is this just an experiment? Um, it was an experiment. Um, the, the plans for the bicycle were ultimately dropped um, because the Spanish-American War was starting to happen. So the troops were reallocated to those fronts and it, it just went away. The, the bicycle was no, no longer tested or used in any sort of experiments for any military trials that I'm aware of. Hmm. Very interesting. Thank yes, you. Sir. Anytime. We have a question here. Uh, after 1897, did they, did their groups uh, uh, participate in any of the future wars like the Spanish-American War, World War I, and World War II? Yeah. Um, they did participate in the Spanish-American War. I know a group of them um, went to the Philippines and they fought in the Philippines. There were some that were sent to Cuba and they fought in Cuba and they, so they were involved in, in sev several of conflicts, several conflicts after um, this bicycle experiment. Thank you and a great presentation. Thank you. It was a really nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You know, uh, Kevin, you're getting some questions in the chat. Should I go ahead and read them to you? Sure, please. Okay? Please, yes, ma'am. 
First one from, from Tom and Tina, were any of the black soldiers interviewed? No, not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. I have not come across any of their actual words. Okay. Great question. I'm going to have to look into that, but not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you say any more about the racism they experienced in Missouri? Did that get reported in the newspapers as well? Um, it did get reported um, in the Missouri newspapers. Um, yes, and there was some colorful language um, in one area of Missouri in particular, in Louisiana, Missouri, that was where they encountered the bulk of the issues. Um, that's where they couldn't get the water. That's where they couldn't get the directions. Um, yeah, so it, it happened right in, right in the Eastern portion of the, the state of Missouri, north of St. Louis. Can you describe how a day would go for the riders, possibly riding time, meals, et cetera? Uh, the riders would start out early in the morning um, they would ride for a couple of hours and then they would take a break for lunch. They would normally not ride during the, the peak sun hours. And after what they encountered in Nebraska, they decided to ride more towards the evening hours and the late night hours, which presents its own set of um, hassles and challenges because then you can't see. And it wasn't like they were riding with lamps or light, lights on their bicycles. So they were covering anywhere from 28 to 50 miles per day. And so they were making pretty good time for there not being any roads and this not having been done before. I hope that answers your question. And then when, are there any good books you could recommend about the bicycle soldiers? Um, yes, there's a good book called The Iron Riders. There's another one called, I believe it's called The Great, Ex Great Bicycle Experiment or Great Experiment. Um, yes, there, there, are, there are several books out there um, about this actual event in history. Kevin, can I interject something, please, sir? Yes, sir, please, please. Okay, uh, there was a question earlier about the bicycles and what happened. The, the bicycles were on loan from Spalding because, like you said earlier, the, the Army didn't spend any money on them. Spalding donated the bicycles, and then they, gave, they, they got them back after they came back off the ride, what was left of Okay. And just so you know, um, Trooper Bobby McDonald is the president of the Greater Los Angeles chapter, so he's quite the authority on this. <laughs> oh, that's who that is. Okay. Thank you. Sure, sure. Any other questions? That's awesome, man. Okay, um, if there's any other questions, uh, you know, feel free to put them in the chat or uh, <laughs> if not, I do want to remind everyone that we, we value your opinion and I'm, I'm going to put this uh, uh, link to the survey and these uh, two future programs in the chat. Oh, it looks like here's a question um, in the chat. Let's see. Are there, um, why didn't the doctor insist on water and directions for his men? Um, I'm not sure that they encountered the issue with the water and the directions under um, James Kennedy's watch. I think that was under Lieutenant uh, James Moss. And instead of um, having seen what he was encountering, knowing it was going to be an issue, um, you can get water from somewhere else. Uh, I, that, that's what I'm assuming. I'm not really sure why they didn't force the issue, but I can imagine um, it had a lot to do with the Little Dixie area and what they were seeing and, and what it represented as far as African-Americans in Union uniform, carrying firearms and making their way across the country on bicycles. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. <laughs> um, has anyone written biographies of any of the individual stories, soldiers, and of the individual soldiers, sorry? Um, there is quite a bit of information out there. Um, I do not think that there are actually any biographies. I would have to check with uh, Trooper McDonald on that. But um, from the information that I found, um, there is a great deal of information on what happened. Like uh, the uh, first sergeant, Mingo Sanders, for example, um, he got into an incident um, in somewhere in Texas where 
they were in a in a barracks the whole night and their commanding officer verified that they did not leave or go anywhere but the townspeople of this one town in texas did not like the fact that they were there and claimed that they had shot up the town and the president actually got involved and he he kicked all of them out of the military and it was like 160 of them um, and one more, another question. Did they ever have to use their guns or fight Indians? Um, they did, but not on the bicycle, not on the bicycle ride. Okay. Are any of the bicycles still in existence? There are some bicycles in, in existence. Um, I believe uh, Trooper McDonald has one. Um, I know that there's one on display in a uh, in a library in St. Louis and Missouri State Parks is actually looking to have two built. The one that'll be on display and then one that'll actually travel with um, traveling exhibits. Well, at least that's the plan for now, I'm, but that could change. Okay, very interesting. We are getting a lot of very positive feedback and, and I, I can tell that uh, most of our participants really enjoyed the program or all of our participants really enjoyed the program. Well, that's, that's awesome, thank you so much. For more information about Missouri State Parks and our upcoming events and programs, please visit MoStateParks.com. For more um, information on Missouri Untold, which are stories like this, um, we have a video series of presentations and the videos can be found on all Missouri State Parks social media platforms. And the video series can also be found on YouTube by searching Missouri Untold. We have a, a few videos there. And uh, my contact information is listed there on the slide as well. And if you have any questions about this or anything else, please feel free to contact me. I thank everyone for their time and attention. And thank you. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Please take a few thank minutes you. of the survey. Well, we really appreciate you joining us this evening. And thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll stay on until everyone's gone. <laughs> OK. Kevin. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, real quick, uh, PBS did a wonderful uh, PBS did a wonderful piece uh, that you can find on YouTube uh, on the ride. Okay. They did a uh, they did a thing. It would, in fact, that was the Washington PBS uh, station. I knew about it because I was involved with uh, PBS SoCal. Uh, and then for for our for our event coming up in 2022, I'm working with uh, the Reno uh, PBS station. They come really. Up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. OK. OK. The city you were talking about was Brownsville. Brownsville in Texas. Brownsville yes, sir. was doing World War. And it was doing the, the World War One. And the reason why they, they got in trouble, um, because it's, it was mutiny. It was doing the war. So that was even though they were in the right, it was it was a mutiny doing the war. And, and, and you know, all those crazy technicalities. Right. So they, right. although Clinton finally, uh, President Clinton finally blessed them all and got them out, but I mean, it's kind of late. Right. A little too late. Yeah. Too little, too late. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. I mean, great presentation, my brother. Very good. So, um, what'd you think, Mr. McDonald? I was kind of well, nervous. That was awesome. It was I was awesome. kind of nervous having you on there, though, because I knew, you know, it's tough no. talking to Buffalo Soldiers about Buffalo Soldiers. No, but, you know, but here's the thing, you know, you, you, you've got a couple of things in here that, um, let's put it this way, you made me go back. Well, we got to do a lot more together because you have some information that I thought was pretty awesome to have. I've seen that picture with the eighth guys on, at, uh, on Yellowstone. Yeah. I've never seen the picture before with, uh, with the Old Faithful. That is so awesome because everybody knows about Old Faithful. That's, that's a huge picture. Ha to have the eight guys, when I was in Missoula, I'm on Missoula a couple of weeks ago, and, and you can see they have a section, with each one of the guys' names, and a little bio in, in, in the case. So they have wow. this nice picture and stuff in the case. So that's what you, you pretty much did the same thing. But they also had, um, you know, what you had was each one of the guy's names that was on that, that picture and when they got to Missoula. I mean, the, the eight riders, right? Okay. See, because most people don't identify them. No, it's just a picture. This has got, but they didn't know it was eight and they didn't know that was the first or the second run. But the, right. fact, the fact that they went to my lake we went, went to Lake McDonald the first time. I yeah. <laughs> Your lake. <laughs> My lake. Yeah. Well, you know, the big peak up there is McDonald Peak. Yeah. So I, you need us to say, I, you know, I did go back and take a picture of all that, right? Yes. Oh, I know you did. I know you did. <laughs> I know you did. Yes, sir. No, but, but what I'm saying to you is that it was laid out really, really nice because, and, 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 and to get the combination of what Bo, Bo sent back that you had, 
and then also what uh, Missoula has, because at the, at the at the museum there, they have all those all the newspaper articles. Wow. So, yeah. but you're right. We, we I need to do like you said, go back and look and see if there was any um, any of the black soldiers were interviewed. Yeah, that that didn't even cross my mind. I didn't even uh, look for anything like that. I, I didn't go that far yet. I think there was a gentleman by the name of Bevins who was a big the big, big Bevins. Um, I'll have to go back and look that up. But Bevins, they have a uh, a picture of him at Fort Missoula. Uh, uh, they have a um, one of them cutouts, and I stood okay. next to it the other day. I, it didn't ring a bell to me until you just brought it up. I said, "Oh yeah, Bevins. You know, he might have been one of them too." Oh, one of the big guys. Yeah, well, the, had... yeah, but yeah. I mean, but again, you have to be five ten. Okay, so right. I'm 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 right there with him. So I get it. All right. <laughs> um, but they have they have one of those in there, and then also. Um, uh, with the VA, they were up there, and in the cemetery, they had 24 Buffalo soldiers buried in the, in the Missoula State in the Missoula Cemetery. So, wow. but, they, but I haven't, I didn't go far enough to the next trip up. I'll identify them all. But they, but they also brought some Buffalo soldiers in from some of the other bases when they closed. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Ke Kevin, you did have one last question in the chat. Did you say they were sent back to Missoula by train? Yeah. Yes, they yes they returned to Missoula by train and they arrived. Um, I believe it was August nineteenth of eighteen ninety seven. Yeah. Ooh, here's a question: How do we find that PBS Washington <laughs> documentary? That's for that's for you, Mr. McDonald. <laughs> well, no, it's it's on it's on. Just go to PBS or type in Iron Riders PBS. It's on and Amazon has it. You can actually buy it. Okay. So, of course, you can go to YouTube and watch it too. But, yeah. <laughs> Because that's what I did, and and also there's a book on there that showed them all. Uh, there's a the army produced a book which I will bring up to Missoula when when we get together, Kevin, uh, on okay. on drills. There was a book the army put together that had drills for for the bike riders to practice. I got to get that for you for your slide for your presentation. You need some of that, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. I can do that. Now this is awesome. I mean, just, this this is an awesome presentation. But yeah, but they had a they had a book. There's a book out that shows all the drills they had to use while riding a bicycle. So this is they just didn't get on the bikes and ride them. They had to practice. right. Somebody yeah. just put a link in the chat to that PBS video. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was very nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Trooper McDonald. Thank you so much. No, no. Uh, and by the way, I want to uh, I want you to know that uh, just for for the record. I'm the public relations officer. I'm not the president. I don't oh. want all that weight on my shoulders. But that's it, man. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm okay. Sorry I'm about okay. that. Hey, no, no, no. It's fine. I can sell that too. You know, <laughs> they just may make me run. They might think it's a campaign thing. And I'm going, no, no. <laughs> don't want to do that. No, no, no. But it's fun. I mean, this is great stuff. I mean, this is, you know, it's wonderful history. And uh, I see that. I think you said Destination Missoula was on. So that's probably Emily. Okay, I the, did see Destination Missoula on, yes. Yeah, the co-chair the co of this event, Miss Emily Ralston from Destination Missoula. So they're, they're, awesome. they're totally committed and involved. So, Well, gentlemen, I think uh, I think we need to uh, go ahead. And I'm sorry. I'll <laughs> halt to the program. We are, we are, uh, uh, I, I think we've answered all of our questions. I do want to thank everyone for joining us. And thank you for your input, uh, Mr. McDonald. That was, was very interesting. And thank you also, Kevin and Cecilia. Thank you. And we'll look forward to Thank next you, Black History and Black Black Baseball and Black History, and then um, our upcoming program on From Slaves to Soldiers on June 1st. So um, thank you. I'll have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys have a great evening. Thank you. Good night.